Hello and welcome to India's World. Today we are going to discuss the attempt by the Sri Lankan government to roll back on its promise of devolution of powers to its Tamil minority. The 13th Amendment to the Sri Lankan Constitution provided for creation of provincial councils with specific powers. This was one of the major outcomes of the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord signed by Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and Sri Lankan President Jay Jayawardene in 1987. Although the 13th Amendment gives the provincial councils power over the police and land resources, the provinces have in reality never exercised these powers because they were never given to them. Now even the constitutional provision for devolution of power is sought to be diluted. What could be the consequences of such a rollback? What does it mean for Sri Lanka and for its Tamil minority? And what does it mean for India as Sri Lanka goes back on a bilateral agreement? To discuss these issues, I have with me a very distinguished panel of experts. I have with me Ambassador Lalit Mansingh, India's former Foreign Secretary. You were High Commissioner to UK, Ambassador to US, and you're also a member of uh, a very special uh, group of uh, eminent uh, diplomats, non-official group of Friends of Sri Lanka, which is trying to help Sri Lankan government deal with the post-conflict reconciliation and reconstruction. Mm -hmm. We have Ambassador T. Parth Sarthi. You were in the PMO when the Sri Lanka Accord was signed. Uh, he's been our uh, High Commissioner to Australia, to Pakistan, Ambassador to Myanmar, an eminent diplomat and a columnist uh, who knows Sri Lanka like nobody else. And we have my old friend uh, A.S. Paneer Selvan, an eminent journalist, reader, editor of the Hindu. Uh, he's also known for his exhaustive and analytical coverage of the Sri Lankan conflict. You've had many friends in uh, the Tamil leadership there. You knew a lot of them, knew because a lot of them are dead or have been assassinated, and you continue to know the present leadership. So welcome, gentlemen, to this conversation. Let me begin with you, uh, Ambassador Mansi. <coughs> President Mahinda Rajapakshe has always said in the past that he would like to give 13th Amendment plus what is provided for in the Constitution plus greater powers to the provinces. How come now he's going back on the 13th Amendment itself? Well, there are, there are certain genuine problems with the 13th Amendment. It was carried out in haste, and you can question some of its assumptions. Uh, one assumption which they're now raising is, can a small country like Sri Lanka have devolution of powers and be a kind of federal democracy within such, such a small geographical area? And basically, there are three issues which are important. Devolution of financial powers, devolution of police powers, and devolution of administrative powers. This is the big debate going on. Now, this was designed as a kind of answer to the Tamil problem in the North, and India assisted in bringing about this solution. The question they are asking is, can you apply the same rules to every province and give them the same devolution? So I think after passing the amendment, the Sri Lankan governments have uh, held back on enforcing it because of this. But a larger issue is really political that after the LTT has been liquidated, the present government thinks there is no need to do anything more. In fact, in fact that's the question I want that to take the to, the, uh, to Partha. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, President Rajapakshe, uh, having defeated the LTT, vanquished this uh, sort of uh, formidable insurgency, uh, thinks that the Tamil problem has disappeared and wants to impose a victor's peace on the Tamils? Well, I, I think... Uh, the, he is under huge pressure from the Sinhala Buddhist lobby uh, to do that. But uh, he will go with whatever the tides suggest for his own uh, political uh, uh, goodness, so or for his political advantage. Uh, I think what Mr. Man Singh said has to be borne in mind, leaving aside the, the whole question of federalism. There are genuine inquiries in devolving police powers to a part of the island contiguous to Tamil Nadu uh, with a Tamil majority population, uh, which has still very strong separatist sentiments. Uh, that, then there is the question of land. Should, it, should any province become exclusively uh, dominated by one community? This is that is land usage. This is land usage and land. So have, land for building public projects, land for building roads. Uh, like land is a state subject in India. Exactly, but you also have cantonment lands in India. You, so it is a, you have railway lands in India. So, uh, but I think basically uh, these are issues which can be addressed. I think he has to be made to agree 
to the 13th Amendment. Then his concerns, which are genuine, I believe, that an armed Tamil police force should not become you know, a factor which causes concern in the union as such. And therefore, for that really what is important is for, is you, I mean, you're into a catch-22. The Tamils and the Sinhalas will have to build mutual confidence. Politicians should help that process. And therefore, he has to vacillate between, the, uh, between these alternatives. But as far as India is concerned, they signed an agreement with us. And they more or less took us to be the guarantors. Therefore, we have an obligation to see that those provisions are implemented. In what form that implementation takes, we'll have to see. Uh, the elections are due in September. Yeah. You have a Commonwealth Summit in November. Uh, so it, this is not going to resolve itself okay. immediately. Okay. Okay. It's to be constant pressure. Paneer, um, this devolution of uh, power seems to be an article of faith with the, the Tamil leadership. Now, for whatever reasons, if you now dilute the 13th Amendment, what impact will it have on the Tamil psyche in Sri Lanka? See, the most interesting things are the interviews Mr. G. L. Perry's gave me over his various tenures as a minister. He had been with the UNP, he had been with the SLFP, with Chandrika, and he's again now the minister with the, uh, with the, minister. Uh, with the uh, Rajapaksha regime. He used this famous phrase called E minus D plus. That is Elam minus devolution plus. And he says there is a singular consensus on it. If there is any number of interviews he has given it, they are on record. Therefore, and that is a theory which India bought lock, stock and barrel. Therefore, now to say that, uh, yeah, there are genuine concerns about 13th Amendment itself. I think that there is a revision of the Indian state's position post LTTE defeat. Because till then, this position had been accepted by the India's, uh, various Indian official statements at least. As a journalist, we are privy only to the official statements. Therefore, E minus D plus had been accepted. Therefore, if the D plus is going to become D minus, 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 I don't think it's a forward movement. Okay, all right. We need to take a break at this juncture. We'll continue with this interesting discussion after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back. We are discussing the possible consequences of Sri Lanka rolling back on its promise of devolution of powers to its Tamil minority. Uh, Ambassador Man Singh, you said that um, President Rajapakshe may have a point when he says that there are practical problems of devolution of power in, um, uh, in a small country like Sri Lanka. What, what, are, what could be these practical problems? And why is he saying that Sri Lanka must have a structure which is acceptable to all and applicable to all provinces? The 13th Amendment is applicable to all provinces. Yeah, that, that is the problem. Uh, there's a fear that if you do that, then you're creating autonomy, which will encourage secessionism. And that's particularly applicable in the North. But I'm not saying I sympathize with that point of view. Okay. I think uh, what I was saying was that they have raised these issues as if this is a genuine practical issue. But the fact is, um, there is the 13th Amendment, that's the law of the land. And there is a commitment by Sri Lanka to the international community and to India. Yeah, we, we, but my point really was that if Sri Lanka is small enough to have separatism, <clears throat> have a huge insurgency, which lasts a couple of decades, why is it not? Uh, why is it small enough uh, for devolution? You know, you can have an insurgency. A problem to uh, the way of to solve it is through devolution of powers. Well, um, there was a comment by Gotabaya mm -hmm. that uh, this is Rajapaksha's brother. Yes, President Rajapaksha's provincial brother. councils are. Uh, white elephant, they are not functioning, and so on and so forth. So this is a symptom of what they're saying, that this is an impractical thing. But that is what they are there. That's the excuse for not uh, implementing the 13th Amendment. Okay. Uh, what I'm saying is the 13th Amendment is a commitment, and yeah. it has to be fulfilled, okay. both to India and to the international community, yeah. and more so to the Sri Lankan people themselves. Yeah, we're going to discuss that yeah. uh, in, in yeah. the subsequent uh, discussion. Um, <coughs> Uh, President Rajapaksha says that the best way of going about uh, uh, discussing the 13th Amendment or building consensus on dilution of the 13th Amendment is the Parliamentary Select Committee. But the Parliamentary Select Committee is a mirror image of the, the alliance that uh, runs the government, except the Sri Lankan Muslim uh, Congress. Others have all joined it. 
So there are 19 people who are pro-government in it. And the pressure is on, on uh, Tamil National Alliance that you know three of you should also come in. Now three uh, Tamil MPs cannot uh, hope to build a consensus uh, among the 19 others to their case. So it's really a, a way of trying to get parliamentary legitimacy for whatever he uh, wants to do. He's clearly stalling for time. Let's have no illusions on that score. Uh, and therefore, I think it is incumbent on India to formally stick to the position 13th Amendment and point out to him that under President Kumaratunga, there was a committee of Neelam Tiruchilvam and uh, Paris, I think Mangala, it was, uh, Mangala. Uh, Mangala and, uh, oh. which recommended 13th, uh, the 13th Amendment plus. So uh, he is clearly, you know, they're being extremely short-sighted. This is the sight of triumphalism of victory. Victories on, in, a, in a battlefield are short-lived if political grievances continue. Well, this is the it. crucial yeah. issue which they have to be persuaded on. And they have, you know, they think they can get away with it because internationally they've got the Chinese behind them, they've got Pakistan behind them, they've got Iran and quite a, a few. But they came a cropper in the Human Rights Commission. Uh, I think uh, you are going to see Western pressure grow. And India's card really is that you would be, we don't want you to be isolated, but you know, you're leaving us with little option yeah. because you sign an agreement with us. Yes. You go back we, on We're going to come to the agreement yeah. in the next section. Yeah. Uh, uh, Paneer, um, do you think President Rajapaksha is in such a hurry because he thinks that if elections are held for the uh, Northern Provincial Council, the Tamil National Alliance would come into power. And once you have a Tamil chief minister, uh, 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 a Tamilian cabinet in the provincial uh, 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 government, the, uh, the position of Tamils on devolution will harden. And it will become that much more difficult to, to dilute the 13th Amendment. See, <clears throat> first, I don't believe that the elections are going to be held without uh, some sort of a promises. Otherwise, there might be a boycott. Uh, there have been cases where the North East Promises elections, about what? Oh, promises of some sort of power. Okay. Devolution. Uh, devolution. It might not be, they might not use the word 13 or they might not use the word 13 plus. They always come up with uh, various euphemism. But some sort of at least an informal thing should have been done because there have also been elections through North and East which have been completely illegitimate in a sense that people did not come to vote. There were voting was less than 10 percent and after the demerger of north and east see that is where the question comes indo sri lankan accord imagines a unified north and eastern province which has been undone okay. by a court oh, judgment. it was undone by a court judgment and it was not challenged by the regime the case was not filed by the regime case was filed by a political party. So, so the dilution oh. already taking place. My yes. question to you really no, is this. One second. Yeah. There is a sequence about India's silence. Uh, see, the silence after LTT's defeat is actually a bit worrying because we all believe that once LTT is done, there is going to be a political solution and there is going to be a process of reconciliation. The demerger, there was no challenging. And government of India did not say a word, challenge it. <coughs> Second uh, thing which happened was Chief Justice of Sri Lanka questioned some of the moves by the regime saying that it's contra-constitutional, it goes against the 13th Amendment. These powers have been already devolved to the pro provincial councils. What happened is instead of listening to the Chief Justice's constitutional argument, Chief Justice has been impeached. Again, what is our position on this entire impeachment move, move? I don't know. Whether there's any at least backroom pressure, we don't know. What has happened is judiciary has been completely undermined. Political parties have been split and been assimilated into the ruling regime. But there mm -hmm. is a certain amount of stream rolling tendency which is there. Okay. Therefore, I'm a bit scared. Okay. And Partha, uh, do you think this too much emphasis on 13th Amendment dilution? Uh, so that attention is taken away from the recommendations of the LLRC, the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission. Because it also talked let, about let uh, demilitarization. Let me answer one thing. The merger was, mm -hmm. was subject to a referendum in the East. Mm -hmm. And we were quite clear in our mind that with the LTT having 
badly mistreated the Muslims. There was no question of the East wanting to stick with a Tamil majority in North. So I think that is a side issue and yep. the Tamils recognize that. The, uh, on, the, on the question of the LLRC and demilitarization, and demilitarization I think that there has to be separate pressure. These are separate issues. Uh, the issue is, as, as uh, Panaji Halvam says, we should have, should have elections. Okay. Now, whether the armed police are going to come under uh, federal control, how you are going to devolve, pass, these can be talked about. Okay. But it is important to have elections, the election of a Tamil legislator, a Tamil chief minister, yeah. so that it's predominantly okay. Tamil, okay. so that the Tamils <clears throat> feel that they are not a subject of Sinhala, triumphalism, because that will have very serious repercussions okay. on us, because our credibility will be called into stake for not enforcing an agreement we signed, and it will have its domestic repercussions okay. on us. Okay, we need to take a break at this juncture. We'll be back again with this discussion. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing the possible consequences of Sri Lanka rolling back devolution of political power to its Tamil minority. Uh, Mr. Man Singh, India apparently has told Sri Lanka that, look, don't dilute the 13th Amendment. In fact, go beyond it. Devolve power. But it, it is also apparently told uh, Colombo that should you uh, persist on following this path, then there will be consequences because you are unilaterally uh, withdrawing from a, an accord that became a basis not only of creation of provinces, powers to them, but also of IPKF going there and so on and so forth. So what are the consequences uh, uh, that uh, India's uh, uh, apparently warning Colombo of? And what happens when a country uh, breaks a bilateral okay. accord? I, I think that's, that's a very good point. Referring to what he said, the sil India's silence. I have to say, India has to be silent because India can't be seen micromanaging Sri Lanka yeah. and its internal affairs. So we can only give them private advice. We cannot take a public position against a sovereign government. Having said that, I think it's understood that there are certain red lines, yeah. what you call a Lakshman Rekha, or I don't know if you call it Ravan Rekha for, for Sri Lanka. But it's understood that Sri Lanka can go only up to a point and not beyond that. The consequences would be, what would happen if the Tamil Nadu politics become hotter and Sri Lanka, the Sri Lanka issue becomes a Tamil Nadu issue as it is already beginning to become, that is a consequence that they have to take into account. They have to take into account the close political and economic linkages we've had, including security cooperation that they've had with India. Are they going to dilute that? Is that a consequence they're prepared to accept? And overall, the attention of the international community. The pressure is growing. The Tamil diaspora is being more active. There are huge consequences for ignoring okay. all these symptoms and saying, we will go ahead and scrap the 13th Amendment. The consequences, I think, are quite clear to them. Okay. Uh, Partha, uh, what Ambassador Man Singh was saying, that Sri Lanka is a sovereign country, uh, and they would say that, look, mind your own business. You know, we've settled the insurgency. Let us handle our internal affairs. And even if uh, the 13th Amendment remains uh, in the Constitution, all yeah. the rules and regulations remain there, and they don't uh, implement devolution, even then nothing happens. I think it is very wrong of us to speak of serious consequences. Threats become empty if they are not carried out, and we know that in Maldives. Mm -hmm. I think what is important is that we engage Sri Lanka. We first and foremost work to get the presence of the Sri Lankan military and its profile in the north reduced, relief and other assistance to the Tamils. Politically, I think, it is important to get others and lobby worldwide to get an international squeeze coming on them. They should know it is coming on, the, uh, on them. They should, they should know we are doing it. But there's no need for us to talk about it. Okay. Uh, Paneer, um, if, if, if President Rajapaksha persists on doing whatever he's doing, and uh, Partha hinted at uh, you know, military presence there. The governor of uh, uh, North is an ex-army officer. Yes. In the eastern province, he's an ex-security officer. Even councillors who are pro-government are complaining that he's coming in the way of the provincial council implementing uh, various decisions and is blocking development work. What will be the consequences of pursuing this path? He is very clear. That's the reason he's doing it. Because if you look at the end of the UNP regime, it happened through a provincial council. Chandrika got elected as a chief minister for Western province, and it was through the Western province that actually the challenge to the UNP emerged. Therefore, 
in the micro politics of Sri Lanka, Mahinda, who had been a field worker, understands things much better. Where he knows that there is a possibility of, it's not just for the Tamils. See, the idea of the first uh, amendment, what he brought in, where he had removed the cap on the presidential term, we have to keep that in mind to understand every development uh, which follows from this regime. The way he had seen that UNP, which was seen as unassailable, was brought to an end through Western province. The first major development happened after the Sri Lanka's devolution happened in the Western province, Chandrika emerging as a chief minister. The way he is really, really aware that if you are going to empower a provincial council, it can actually also have a change or an impact in the national politics. Okay. And he has also seen the type of changes India has witnessed. The post-1996, we don't have a high command sitting in Delhi deciding everything else, various regional leaders are asserting. Therefore, at some level, this entire Indian model threatens a highly centralized imagination. So, uh, what I would like uh, the three of you to do now is tell me what are the challenges that India faces in Sri Lanka between balancing its strategic interests with uh, its sympathy for the uh, Tamil population there, the Tamil minority of Sri Lanka. How do we balance these two objectives? Well, and how difficult all, is it? First of all, I think we should be clear. We have strategic and economic interests in Sri Lanka and we will pursue them. They will be kept in different boxes and not, not react with each other. On the political issue, we have a stake in the future of the Tamils in Sri Lanka in the sense. We have been stakeholders there and we have guaranteed the, the territorial integrity of Sri Lanka. We should see this through. And if, we, if they are not sensitive to what we are suggesting behind closed doors, I think the next step would be we'll have to come out in the open. To some extent, we have done that with our voting in the UNHRC, but they'll probably see more of that. So I think that is, this is a period of sending out signals and telling them how far the president can go and yeah. how far he cannot. But how difficult is it to handle Sri Lanka? Look, amongst our neighbors, I think they are easier to handle than some others. Uh, also, if you, if you even you see in a cricket field, the Indian team is cheered. There is, there is, you don't have the sort of uh, hostility you feel in other, other, uh, other neighbors. You won't find that in Sri Lanka. Therefore, uh, we have to handle them in a way uh, by which we are able to pursue our uh, strategic interests. Yeah. I think we are doing it well in Trincomalee. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, but we came very close to having problems on that also. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, as I said, pressure has to come. They should know it is coming through India okay. without our opening our mouth and screaming our heads off. Okay, last sentence to you quickly because we are running out of time. What we should have to we do doing? more. Uh, whether it's overt or covert, that I don't know. They have uh, more experience on that. Mm -hmm. But I definitely feel that we have to do more before the, it slides below a particular threshold point. Yeah. Because it's also the question of trust. Okay. Okay, so we've run out of time. I'd th like to thank all of you for coming here and analyzing the Sri Lankan situation for our viewers. That's all we have for you today. We'll be back again next week with another interesting issue. Till then, goodbye. <laughs>